Good evening. I'm Paul Siciliano, and on behalf of the North Carolina State University Amazing Grazing Team, I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar series on um, pasture ecology. This is the first in, in a series of three that will go on for the next uh, two Wednesday nights. And this series is actually a, a version of the National Pasture Land Ecology course from NRCS. Our first speaker tonight uh, is Dr. Matt Poor. Dr. Poor is a professor of animal science and beef extension specialist at North Carolina State University. He directs the Amazing Grazing Program and he provides leadership to the NC State Extension Animal Agricultural Program team. He has 32 years of experience doing applied research and extension work across the state of North Carolina and the Southeast US. His major program areas are the use of alternative feeds, forages, and forage management approaches for beef cattle. Dr. Poor is the chair of the Alliance for Grassland Renewal, a national group focused on improving the understanding of and achieving the adoption of novel end of fight all fescue technology. So with that, uh, I will go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Poor. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Paul, if you, if you can't see that, uh, wave your hand, but I'm assuming that you're seeing my screen. And um, I really, uh, you seeing it? No. Oh, there it is. You got it. Good to go. Okay. Okay, just a little slow to come. So hopefully, uh, we'll, uh, we'll everything will work good tonight. I, I appreciate everybody being on and, and look forward to, uh, to starting this discussion. Uh, very, uh, something that has become very fascinating to me and I know all of our team uh, have really started to, uh, to look at the world in a very different way when we go into pastures and that'll become apparent as we go along. So uh, just to, uh, to get us started, you know, pastures are very, very complex ecosystems. Uh, they have animals, plants, and many other organisms that are in a physical environment and they're all interacting and all interrelated. And so uh, that's really what pasture ecology is, is the study of this interrelationship of, of uh, animals, plants, and, and other organisms and how they relate to that environment. So, uh, over the next uh, three three Wednesday nights here, we're going to carry you through some of the details of that, but continue to come back to how do they all fit together? How are they? Uh, how you know? How are they organized out there in your fields? And and what are some of the things that you need to start thinking about uh, if you want to improve your forage systems? So we all know um, lots of practices that we do on our farm. Uh, I was raised and and trained as an animal person. So my main perspective is to look at the animals and understand everything about them. But when I started working on pastures, it became quite apparent that without an understanding of all this complex system, uh, I, I could do things to the animals, but not be very successful simply because there are so many other things going on that, that, are, that are impacted uh, by our management decisions. So if we look at our, uh, at our what we call an agro ecosystem, that, that's what this is. It's a, a pasture is a managed ecosystem that includes what we call the biotic components. Those are the living components and the abiotic, which are the non-living components. So the abiotic, you know, you can, uh, we, we're all pretty familiar with that, the air, water and soil minerals, the sand and clay part of the soil, and the biotic or the living part includes the animals, the plants, and then the very many different types of microorganisms that are, uh, that are there in, that, uh, in, in, in the pasture in one way or another. Now, the way that these uh, are, are kind of organized or thought of is that there are, of course, individual um, animals or plants or microorganisms they are organized into populations, um, many of the same type or species of those. And then those populations are organized into communities. And then those uh, various communities like the soil, uh, the soil community and the wildlife community above ground, they are all part of that bigger agroecosystem. So we can break this down and study the individual components. 
but to really understand how it all, to have some impact on it, we need to understand that they all work together and that we need to be thinking about all of those things all at the same time. Now, it's very important for the future of the world that we keep in mind that, uh, you know, we've got a challenge feeding all the humans that we have. We have things like climate change that we're worried about. Uh, and, and one thing that we often talk about is, uh, you know, we do have uh, a problem uh, in, in some extent from an ecological perspective with the fact that many of our food animals being um, poultry, swine, you know, the monogastrics, they actually eat food that could be eaten directly by humans. So I have a picture of corn there and the starch and proteins and all in corn uh, can be worked pretty well into a human diet as we're all aware. And so animals that must eat those uh, concentrated feeds, like again, swine and, and, and poultry, they, uh, they, they are in direct competition with humans for, for things that we eat. Whereas ruminants like these uh, grazing steers here in this picture, they're eating forages, which are not something that can be consumed by humans. And so uh, ruminants are very efficient in the big scheme of things because they largely can live off stuff that we could not use as food and they can con convert that into a high quality uh, protein product. And so that's what we, that's why we have grazing systems and these grazing animals for the most part. Now we will talk about horses, of course, they're a little bit different, but uh, nevertheless, uh, whether it's a food system or a, um, a, a, a companion animal system like with horses, these, these forages are very good for the earth, the, uh, the, the um, perennial forages have very good quality roots, very deep roots. They leave a lot of carbon in the soil and if managed properly are very, very beneficial to the overall climate. It's also very true that a large part of the land on the earth's surface cannot be farmed with conventional farming techniques. It's either too steep, too rocky or something like that, uh, too dry but we can grow forages and ruminant animals are a key part of that. So, so just to look to the future, this is gonna become a more and more important topic as we try to get those benefits to the, uh, to, to, to the, uh, the ecosystem uh, from the forages and pastures, but also so that we uh, continue to efficiently produce high quality food for, uh, for, for the human population. Now, what are the components? I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of these components as we go. And the first one I'll mention is the soil. We do, uh, we do base everything on the soil. Uh, we, you know, the, the, without the soil, we would do nothing. You know, the soil is a very complex uh, environment in and of itself. We know that there are things like the texture, uh, sand, silt, and clay. And if you, uh, you know, if you're on land, have land or manage land or advise farmers with land, you probably have some idea of what the textures of your soils are. They do determine what you can grow in them and how dry they become, those kinds of things. There's also soil structure, the, uh, the three-dimensional structure of soil particles as they get glued together by the, largely by the biological life there in the soil, but that physical structure is important. Of course, there's chemistry uh, in the soil, things like cation exchange uh, capacity, the nutrient levels in the soil, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, that sort of thing, uh, the pH or how acid the soil is, the presence of organic matter. All of those are sort of the chemical pieces of that. And then the fourth one is the biology. And this is the part that's been probably the least understood, the least studied, uh, and by far the most complex part of the of the soil system. And we'll learn a lot more about that uh, on the second night, the uh, next week. Uh, but I will just say that there's a lot of soil biology, a lot of things going on that, uh, that, uh, that we need to better understand soils and how to get the most out of them. We need to be thinking about the big scale ecosystem processes that, that are out there at work in your pasture. And so again, these are all things we'll come back to uh, and, and or that you can read more about, but we do have uh, nutrient cycles out there, uh, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, then all the nutrient cycles, including like nitrogen, phosphorus and all others. And why I, I say cycles is that it, the stuff, you know, goes in the animals and comes back out and goes into the soil, comes back to the plants 
And there are these cycles out there that, uh, that, that are uh, in, in operation. And then finally, community dynamics. And this is a little more complex concept, uh, but basically how all of those things fit together uh, with the, 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 the various communities of organisms that are out there and how they all impact each other. So again, we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about all of those issues. Now, if we jump to the plants and talk a little bit um, um, about the plant component, the big piece, the other one of another of the big pieces. We do have, um, you know, herbaceous and, and woody plants. So those, uh, you know, the herbaceous are the ones when we talk about that, we're talking about clovers and grasses and stuff that's fine texture uh, and does not get woody. And of course the woody ones are things like brush, blackberries, rose bushes, and then trees that may start in a succession in a pasture. And so we have to be uh, also thinking about how uh, natural succession go, wants to go in a pasture. Basically, if you're in a, in, in a place that, that, is, um, uh, that was historically in forest, like where we are in North Carolina, then uh, it's trying to become forest again. You have to manage to keep uh, woody, uh, woodies from encroaching in your pastures and, and think about that. Um, uh, if you're in the plains, then uh, may, maybe you're more worried about invasion of some uh, of some things like Cerisia lespidiza that are herbaceous plants that are undesirable in the environment. We also uh, can talk about annuals and perennials, and this is real important for you to understand that if you don't, the annuals have uh, a very short lifespan. They live less than one year in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in, in the hemisphere where we are, uh, this far above the equator. And they, uh, they, they're like sprinters. So annuals come up, they grow very quickly, they make seed very quickly, and then they die. They, they, they have a very short life, whereas the perennials live for many, many years. And uh, perennials uh, come out slower. They typically grow slower in the early years, but then they get well established and can continue to produce for many, many years. And so uh, we need to understand the balance of those we also have cool season plants and warm season plants. And uh, Dr. Harmon will talk a little bit more about this, but we have some species like tall fescue and orchard grass that far prefer the, the cool season. And then we have warm season plants uh, like switchgrass, Bermuda grass, Dallas grass that function better in warm. And they also have different pathways for their photosynthesis. And I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but it makes warm season plants quite efficient uh, at, at uh, making, um, uh, you know, making tissue from nutrients and rainfall compared to uh, the way cool season plants do. And again, uh, plenty of, uh, of examples of those. Now it's important that we are aware that, uh, that these plants have different, uh, you know, different tops, the, the part that we see and that we have animals eating, but they also vary quite a bit in their root structure. And so, Again, as we, as we talk about soils and stuff, we need to be aware that sometimes having mixtures of plants out there in the pasture allow us to, uh, to get more out of the pasture because we have roots that are exploring different uh, depths and, and, and in the pasture and different ways of absorbing and they, they don't necessarily compete with each other all, all the time. And of course, uh, a typical warm season, cool season uh, curve here with the blue being cool season. We see a big peak of growth uh, here in the, the spring through early summer. We see a slump in the middle of the summer. And then we see another uh, bump of growth in the fall. The warm season grasses, of course, um, and, and other uh, warm season forages start their growth in the spring. They, uh, they, they start and they grow very rapidly during the hot summer months, especially if there's adequate uh, moisture uh, for them to work with. And, and so as you can imagine, uh, to have a very productive system that is productive year round, then you need a combination of these, uh, of these uh, warm and cool season pastures. So uh, we, we may have those in separate pastures on our farm, or many of us that have older pastures have both warm season and cool season in the same pastures. And that's a little bit of a different management challenge, but certainly a, a good thing for the overall productivity of your farm. Now, turning to some of the major animal points that we need to start with, uh, we do have uh, grazing livestock, and in this, in, in, with this animals, I'm talking about the livestock at this point, 
uh, and whether it's cows, horses, sheep, or goats, we need, to, we need to understand a little bit about our animals and how they feed and what they eat. And one thing that you'll notice, there are very big differences in the mouth uh, of, these, uh, of these different animals. Of course, uh, ruminants, cows, sheep, and goats have no teeth on the top. And I think you can see that in each of these, uh, that they don't have top teeth, whereas a horse has, has teeth on the top and the bottom. And this gives some implications in the way that they graze. Also, the width of their mouth becomes an important consideration. And we'll talk a little bit more detail about that. But if they have a very wide uh, uh, muzzle, they're not able to be as selective. Whereas sheep and especially goats, they have very narrow, uh, narrow mouths and it makes them uh, able to more uh, easily select very specific parts of plants. So if you watch them graze, uh, animals uh, uh, over here, a cow, she wants to stick her tongue out, wrap it around grass, pull it in, and then it's sheared off by those bottom teeth against that upper pad in her mouth. A goat can nibble with its lips. It actually has prehensile lips, so it can, it can nibble and get the leaves off of a, this is a, I believe a rose bush and picking the individual leaflets off of that. So they're very good at selecting a high quality diet. A horse, again, a wide mouth with teeth on the top and the bottom and they can graze into the soil. And so again, some of the problems with horses that, uh, that, that we have is because they are such good, so good at grazing very short. Now we'll uh, relate that into what they prefer as their diet. And uh, horses are clear grazers. And so they prefer to have grass. They will eat a little bit of weeds and a little bit of browse, but they, they would prefer a high level of grass in their diet. This is if they have a high level of selection, that's what they'll select. Cattle, they will, um, they will eat mostly grass, but they'll eat a little bit more weeds or forbs would probably be a better word for that. And then also they will browse a little bit on rose bushes, blackberry bushes and other um, things that may be there in the pasture. Sheep are not that different from cattle, but again, they graze a little less on grass and they eat a little bit more weeds and, and browse. And then goats are, are very much what we call concentrate selectors. They, they get out there and they really like the browse. So in this particular data set, they were eating about 60% of, the brow, of, of their diet as browse, 20% as, as uh, some uh, herbaceous weeds and then a little bit of grass. And so so there are some big preferences here and you need to think about this as you set up your grazing system, you would have a very different system for goats than you would for cattle or horses. And uh, if you're trying to keep goat feed on your farm, for example, you wanna have all the goats and you really want them eating somewhere above their, uh, their you know, uh, above the ground, you don't want them eating right down on the ground because of parasites, then you need to think about some taller plants, maybe some browse and, and not, raising that so hard that you kill it off. Now, I want to uh, turn here a little bit and talk a little bit about dung beetles. There are a lot of things in pastures that maybe they're unappreciated. And when I say here, dung beetles are an unappreciated part of pasture ecology. They're getting more and more press, but uh, many people only know about the rollers. So there's three types and shown on this slide. Over here on the right is, the roll, is a roller that takes a ball of manure, rolls it across the pasture, and then they find a place to bury it in the ground. We have um, a type here that's called in the middle that's called a tunneler, and they they uh, fly into the cow pie and then they bury manure down uh, at depths in the soil up to sometimes as deep as 18 inches. And then there are others that are called dwellers, and they stay in the, the that all the time. Now, again, I. At one time, I didn't even realize there were dung beetles in our pastures, and then I did some research on this, and we did some trapping, and we actually trapped about 23 different species of dung beetles here in North Carolina, uh, and it's very it changed my. I, I can't I can't go into a pasture again and 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 uh, and not look for dung beetles. So it's something that will get you hooked into this study of pasture ecology. Of course, things like earthworms and other large biology are very important uh, in opening up this uh, this soil. But uh, just a few little more words about dung beetles. Uh, you know, this top, uh, this top slide, this one here had no dung beetles in it. This one over here had dung beetles for about a week's time. Uh, you can see this, uh, this cow pie still sitting on the surface. This one has been well great. It's really just a shell of what was there. And our research has shown that this, 
These nutrients are taken down deep in the soil, and that's of real importance in the overall nutrient cycling in your pastures. Now, um, and this is just like a little dung beetle farm and pretty, pretty amazing stuff of what they, what they can do. So um, a lot of people tell me, well, I don't have dung beetles, Dr. Poor, and I, I, don't, I don't know why, and I've never seen them. So uh, take a flat shovel out to your pastures here over the next few months. Uh, and uh, when you see a fresh cow pie that looks like it's kind of been churned up by something or whatever to underneath it, uh, turn it over and you'll see that in that cow pie there were about, uh, you know, several hundred dung beetles. So again, scoop under it, let it set about 30 cents, flip it over and you will see dung beetles if they're on your farm. And so encourage you to get out, start exploring these things. Uh, and, and look underneath that cow pie and, and just realize those holes are so much importance in, in the overall pasture ecology. And of course, don't forget to take your soil out, your shovel out there and, uh, and also dig down and look at, at things like earthworms and, and soil, um, soil texture, soil uh, aggregation as shown in this shot. Uh, get out there and explore in your pastures. Now, if I thought this uh, animal or an important part of this, and this picture is uh, three of my cows, and at one time, that's all I saw when I looked at this picture. But certainly, we're looking at a big solar collector that takes solar energy and converts it into carbohydrates that, and, and proteins and everything else that those animals can use. It's also the way that we collect rainfall. And so uh, having green grass underfoot uh, as, as much of the year as possible is really critical in terms of driving production and, and growth in the pastures. Now, another thing that we need to think about, and this is kind of related to the dung beetle topic, but we do need to be um, doing the best we can to recycle nutrients into the pasture. We do have uh, many of these, um, you know, many of these nutrients, about 75 to 90% of that does get returned uh, to the pasture. And, uh, and we have things like the nitrogen cycle. So again, I don't want to get into the complexity of this. We don't have time today. But when nitrogen uh, comes into the system, you know, we can, we can do that through nitrogen fertilization uh, through a factory and bring it in. But we also can grow it with legumes on the pasture, as shown in this little piece of the diagram. Uh, and it enters the, the soil, and then it grows plants. Uh, we also uh, have the nutrients that are coming from the cow manure going down into that pool. So this continues to cycle and there is a whole lot of nitrogen in the soil profile uh, that can come available over time, even if we don't put it on fertilizer. So we'll learn about that on the next, on the next webinar. Uh, if you look at your farm, this is a farm that we have a nutrient map on and, and these colors are blue is a lot of phosphorus and orange, is, uh, is basically deficient in phosphorus. And so uh, if you look at this farm and understand that right here in the middle is where our, 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 our headquarters is, there are parts of this farm that are heavily loaded with nutrients and other parts that are not uh, so heavily loaded. And that, that becomes really critical because uh, we need to be thinking about where manure falls. And so uh, control grazing or moving animals frequently allows you to get manure deposited in a much more even way than was shown in that previous picture, which primarily came from hay feeding. Well, we roll hay on the land, the cattle moved out, we could use bale grazing, another technique that's becoming popular. And, uh, and we can end up with a lot of good fertility that comes from those nutrients that are cycled through the animals. So again, we need to make sure that we're getting the most out of that that we can. So I'm not going to uh, show you a real complex diagram, but when you think about what's going on in pastures, some of it could be right here. And uh, we've got, uh, in addition to a lot of the pieces I've mentioned, like the plants and the, and the livestock, the dung beetles, we also have a lot of other uh, soil organisms that are down there. We also have stuff like uh, you know, mice and deer and other uh, insects that are above ground, and all of that is critical to the overall functioning of the pasture. Now, this, this diagram, I realize, and I, I've seen this many times, and one time I realized this is incomplete because there's the most important animal in the, in the system is not shown, and that is you. So we are part of this ecological system. And so that's what we want to try to do through this webinar is to get you thinking about you yourself as part of this pasture, not 
standing outside looking in and and that's a real key component so you got to get out on your feet you got to get down there on your knees looking at the biology and and you will become part of this system and that's really i guess our goal and hope for you as you uh, take on the study of this area now there's a lot of benefits to to doing um uh, grazing management, we call adaptive grazing management. I'll talk a little bit about that, but basically uh, we can make more money through this. Uh, it's good for the animals. We do have um, uh, excellent nutrition, but we also have improved cow comfort when they're out on grass. Uh, health problems are noticed much more quickly because you're around your animals and it's actually better for your own mental health. We also have many environmental benefits uh, or um, ecosystem services. Sometimes that's called with water quality. Uh, improving that nutrient distribution is very good. And then improving soil health actually improves soil carbon and therefore is really good for the climate as well. So lots of benefits of this and, and it's a system that should be managed better than it is, frankly, out there across the world. So let's talk a little bit about what we're talking about in terms of some of the terminology. Y'all have seen many names for grazing management systems. Intensive grazing, management intensive grazing, all of these have been used at one time or another, and many of them mean the same kind of things. They're very they're a little vague, and the most common now is regenerative grazing. And, um, and they're, they're all very, you know, they're very similar. The technique, basically what we're looking at is short grazing periods and long rest periods. And that's basically, these are all, all types of that. Now, now, uh, regenerative grazing, the only thing about it is that it is, uh, you, you take the approach that this system is degraded and it needs to be constantly improved. And we all know that, we all would agree with that. And so everything we do is really in, in the regenerative spirit of trying to improve the soils and improve our farms. And, and that's what we all do. So there's many techniques we can use for that. Now, uh, I, we need a, a definition, and I'll just throw this one out. Johnny came up with this a few years ago, and we're still using it. Uh, it's the practice of using proven grazing management principles and practices to meet the dynamic, biologic, economic, and social needs of an individual grazing operation and their community. So a very broad term, but that's what it is. It's, it's basically we are going to use all the techniques that we have and spend a lot of time thinking and a lot of time out there in our pastures with our, with our animals. Now, um, we need to talk a little bit more about this because adaptive management is a broader concept. It's not just for grazing. There are many systems that use adaptive management principles. And so this works best when you have a system that there's a lot of variables that you can't control and that are hard to predict. So when you go out there, you know, um, you don't know what you're gonna get into the next day in your pastures. You've got to be somewhat fluid and, uh, and, and smoothly make changes in your plan uh, because you, don't, you have some unexpected things that will happen. So your long-term goals stay the same, but the path to get there may vary and it may vary on a weekly or monthly basis depending on situations that you get yourself into. So the principles of adaptive management are here and it's basically a reiterative process. So you need to evaluate your resources and come up with a goal for what you're gonna to try to do with your farm. Then you need to develop your initial plan and you need to implement that plan. Now, the key to it comes next. You evaluate the short-term outcomes of that plan. Did they graze it too short? Did they graze it not short enough? What? going out there and thinking through, evaluating yourself each day or, or over short periods of time, and then say, well, I didn't do that right. I need to change. I need to do it differently. Maybe it didn't rain. Maybe it rained too much, but modify that plan. And then the last thing is you just keep repeat, repeating uh, step four through six. So you keep doing some things, evaluating it, and then modifying and doing things differently. This creates a rapid learning. And you should try all kinds of techniques and evaluate them and then either put them in your system or, or don't, or don't, you know, get rid of them, but, but always be open to new ideas. So um, we talk about, you know, people ask me what's amazing grazing. Well, it's the educational program that's bringing you this webinar series, but it's also a, um, uh, you know, it's also sometimes you go out on a farm and you see it. And this is an example of a farm with uh, where the grass, the cattle, the 
the poly wire there, the electric electricity, the soil, everything is coming together. And you just are like, my gosh, this is amazing. This is what I'm trying to do. Maybe you go to a farm and you just see things that are just popping out of the ground, high quality forages, this being a chicory in a, in a complex perennial mix. But, uh, you know, there's some amazing stuff that goes on out there. So we're, we're all enthusiastic and, and interested in this kind of stuff. And, and you should be amazed by your pastures. And if you'll start looking at them and, and evaluating them, you, you, will be, you will be that. So to, to do this, you really need to decide you're going to make a change in your system if you want to. Uh, really get the most out of it. Understand that this pasture ecology is very complex, but it is worth learning about and managing. Get around other farmers that have an interest in this. There's a lot of them out there now, and they would love to visit with you. It's a very collaborative kind of a community. Uh, you want to go do that uh, preliminary system assessment, including soil testing on all your farm. Uh, we'll talk about that again a little bit next week. Uh, upgrade your electric fence skills because this is really the way this is done. If you don't have electric fence, you're very uh, you're very hampered in being able to control uh, where the animals are. You need to develop a good management plan, and then upgrade your infrastructure: more water, more fencing, uh, and and most importantly, don't give up. Now we have a, a publication called "The Twelve Steps to Amazing Grazing." You can find it online and search that out, and and that'll help you to think through where you're at on on this and, and how, to, how to continue to improve your farm, no matter where you are, we all can improve and, and should. Now, uh, people that are very successful at this, uh, we know a lot of those guys, and so we kind of come up with this list. They're very open-minded, they're very flexible. Uh, they critically evaluate everything and learn from their mistakes, and that's the most important thing. There are no mistakes if you learn in the process. Uh, don't be tied to too, too tied to one system. Now, some people will tell you you've got to let the pl plants get really big and old, and you have to have a lot of diversity. Uh, you know, there there are many ways to get this done. So don't don't think that you have to do it exactly like someone tells you. Your farm system will be different than everyone else's. Stay interested. Uh, you know, keep continue to study, continue to dig. Uh, and learn to see all the complexity without actually looking at it. And I'll, I'm not going to get into the deep philosophy of that, but once you start studying all the components, at some point, it all comes together and you don't have to think about raising height and forage type, all of those things, you just know that all together and you quit thinking about it consciously. And that's when you really are getting there. And then finally, enjoy it. The reason I do this is because I'm, uh, it, it's, it's true joy for me when I'm out in the pasture, things are working good and I'm with my calves. Uh, there are people to ask, is there evidence that this is actually true, Dr. Poor? This, this is good for the land and good for the world, but we did some work uh, recently that was published that showed that uh, improving your level of grazing management will improve your soil test biological activity or the, the, the biology in the soil. You're gonna learn more about what that is. It improves nutrient cycling, it increases soil carbon, it's good for the climate, and it, it, and, and it improves our ability to grow grass without fertilizer. And so all of those are goals that many people have. Now, why don't people do this? Well, uh, it's not traditional. Maybe they think they don't have enough time. Uh, they don't have key management skills. Peer pressure tells them, you know, you, you don't want to do that because somebody's going to laugh at you for, for getting out there with that little string and, and controlling cows. It seems complicated to a lot of people, and it can be. And many people just don't understand how to use like a fence, and it's as simple as that. But there are many reasons for that. Uh, this is a picture of my dad, and he's passed away now, but uh, it was a long struggle with him. But once he saw it with his own eyes like he's doing in this picture, he became a real believer in this. It's just something that uh, it's it's a little bit different from what we've seen. So uh, again, a lot of uh, a lot of good things have happened out there with people on the land with the animals talking about pasture ecology. We've had some great um, cooperators over the years. This being Mike Jones here, that's one of those people that convinced me that being in the middle of that ecosystem was the key component of that. Uh, and then uh, there are many other things that we need to think about. There are a lot of key tools that we need to learn. And I just encourage you to seek out workshops. We're going to have a lot of workshops over the coming year uh, in local communities so that people can come out and learn about electric fence and, and some of the management principles that go into this. 
because once you start getting it down and your cattle or your livestock are trained to polywire, uh, you, you understand how to put them on grass and get it utilized the way you want. You have tremendous power uh, over management in your system. And, uh, and, you know, many people come, this is my farm. Many people come and say, well, I just can't do that on my farm. But uh, yes, you can. Absolutely. It takes a few steps, but you can get there. So with that, uh, Paul, I'm gonna, I think my time is, is, uh, is up. Uh, and I want to just finish by, by showing you, uh, 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 you know, a way that you can get involved in this. So this is just a one gallon pot with a fescue plant I dug uh, uh, and put in there. So, um, you know, do a little homework, go and set you up a couple of pots like this. And Dr. Harmon is going to tell you about grazing management, but graze one of them uh, every few days, every time it puts out to uh, shoots, graze them off just as if you were a cow out there waiting for the next little grass to come up and let one go to about uh, 10 inches and then cut it back to six every time it needs that, maybe every three weeks. And, and just watch those grow over the early summer here and then look at the roots after, after a while. And so uh, a little exercise you can do at home that will be very informative to you. Okay, with that, Paul, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt, uh, for, for an excellent uh, introduction and overview of uh, pasture land ecology. Folks, we'll have uh, time to answer questions at the very end of this. And so as we go along, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will uh, uh, consolidate those and get to them at the very end.